Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 202. Only I can change my life. No one can do it for me. Carol Burnett. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Video Blocks. Now, guys, when I was shooting my show for Legendary Pictures, uh, and I did that 96 pages in four days, I actually got into post, and we used a lot of stock footage, stock sounds, and even some uh, graphics from Video Blocks. They are an amazing resource. With your membership, you are granted the rights to use that footage forever in perpetuity on any projects you want to. So if you want to try a seven-day free trial, and by the way, anything you download during those seven days is yours to keep. And if you decide to stay, you get 84% off the yearly membership. It is well worth it, guys. Trust me, if you do a lot of production, it is something you really need. So just head over to videoblocks.com forward slash hustle. And today's show is also sponsored by Masterclass and specifically the new directing Masterclass by Oscar-winning director, Ron Howard. Ron Howard has grossed over $1.9 billion at the box office and has made Oscar-winning movies like The Da Vinci Code, Cinderella Man, Apollo 13, and The Beautiful Mind, just to name a few. And his master class, which I've been able to to watch already and, and take, was amazing. It was just so insightful, and it's a must for any film director or any filmmaker who wants to direct uh, the knowledge bombs that he drops are amazing so just head over to indiefilmhustle.com forward slash ron howard so guys i want to ask you a question who here listening today is looking for money for their next film their next short their next uh tv series or whatever who here wants money for their film projects please I- i'll wait yeah, I thought so. Everybody. And it is something that uh, all of us struggle with. And and really, there's a mystery almost, uh, almost a mythological mystery on how to, you know, approach people to get money, how to package projects, how to put things together to get uh, to get financing, to get money. And, and what is viably, what is financially viable as a project? Sometimes filmmakers don't understand that their their passion project is just maybe not investable. In you know, it's just something that's not going to return money at a higher budget range. And would you rather get that information at the beginning of your quest to get the money for this project, or at the end of it? And I really wanted to like kind of pull back the curtain on this mystery and talk to someone who really knows about how to get money for your films. And today's guest is that person. Today's guest is Franco Sama. He is a an executive producer. He is the man who you pitch to if you want to get money. Now, he finds money. He has relationships with investors, and he's the guy who connects everything. He's the guy who packages projects together with the filmmaker to try to get money for their projects, and he has worked on many feature films as an executive producer, and Franco's one of those guys who, you know, literally came up from the streets, if you will. He hustled his way into the business, and uh, he's an amazing guy. And I really learned, personally learned so much from talking to Franco. And this episode is just a wealth of information on how to get money for your film. It is how to do it right, how not to do it right how to package a project, what needs to be in place to go after money. We discuss the one thing that all filmmakers need in order to receive money for their movie. And we talk about it in this episode. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I really think you guys are going to get a just a lot of information out of this. So get a notepad ready, get your iPad ready, take some notes because you're going to probably listen to this episode multiple times. And please, Please, for God's sake, share this episode with anybody and everybody you know in the film industry who is actively looking for money or going to be looking for money for a feature film, a series, any kind of uh, content that they're going to be creating and looking for money for. Please share this episode. Tell people about it because I want this information out there. And Franco was 
so generous with his time and knowledge and experience. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Franco Sama. I'd like to welcome to the show Franco Sama from Samaco Films. Thank you so much for being on the show, Franco. Oh, thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure. So how did you break into this crazy business? <laughs> Uh, well, it's interesting because I started off, well, I moved here in, from Boston in 1997 okay. and, um, I was a little over the hill at the time <laughs> to be, to be starting off, you know, I was 40 years old competing with, you know, people <sighs> half my age, you know, uh-huh. and but the difference was I didn't have any experience and, and they did. So, um, so anyway, I started off as a publicist. My strategy was if I could get in front of the right people on the right carpets and kind of meet, you know, mingle, mm-hmm. um, that might help. And it actually worked. My first three gigs out of the gate were in order, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, Will Smith and Jada, and then Gary Oldman. So I really had, uh, <laughs> but what did really, you, so you just worked as a publicist and then you just met them on the red carpet and I connected. Worked a, I worked as a publicist for, for a, for a celebrity photographer. Mm-hmm. And so my job was to, as his publicist, was to kind of book the gigs and get the magazine, you know, uh, various magazines to to hire him to do, you know, s- specific pieces on 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 uh, celebrities. And those were the first three that we started off with. So Not bad. I real, my plan sort of worked, you know, because I, I, they put me out in front very, very quickly. I'd only been here for two months mm-hmm. and I was rubbing elbows with some of the, you know, A-list Stars in Hollywood. That said, you know, after a couple of years of that, which was fun, it was great and it was a great experience, but I wasn't really getting, you know, what I came here for, which was to promote my own career. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started my first production company in 2005 uh, with a business partner. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We just kind of broke out and started figuring, uh, figuring out, well, maybe the best way to do this is to we didn't have any of the criteria mm-hmm. that some of the potential investors were requiring for our films. Um, and we had the investors, but we just didn't have the stuff that they needed. <laughs> so what we, did was we got on IMDb and we started searching out pro- producers that had the stuff that we didn't have. And we basically acted as matchmakers and put the investors together with the producers and watched them all do their their magic together. And the only thing we asked for in return was some money and some credits Mm -hmm. and, and the experience. And after five or six of those, we were like, okay, we get this, we can do this ourselves. And before we, you know, before I knew it, I was, um, I was doing it on my own. Very cool. So you're, so you acted more as an executive producer. Yes, I do. I do. Even now I, it's kind of in my blood, you know, I've always been a business, uh, oriented person Mm -hmm. my whole, my whole life. I love business, um, but I love the business of the movie business. Mm-hmm. So I do spend most of – I do produce films. I love that. I enjoy mm-hmm. it. I don't spend a lot of time on set. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of my time is spent putting financing, distribution, uh, talent, you know, packaging, that kind of thing. So it is It is an art form what you do. You You are one of those, uh, one of those you know, uh, magicians behind the curtain. That a lot of filmmakers and a lot of people don't understand what they do when they see that name fly up on a credit on a screen. They really don't get what an executive producer does because they're very integral. <laughs> Without them, they really can't make a movie sometimes. Well, yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I do. I have this uh, thing I say that, you know, executive producers is, is code for money, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but when people email me and they call me and they go, hi, I'm looking for an executive producer. You can scratch that word out and put in the word money and then you get the same thing. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so, but yeah, there is an art form to it. You know, I, I'm, rem- I'm reminded of a day many, many years ago. Uh, I walked into some agent's office uh, on a whim. I was trying to, I was actually back in the days where I was talking about with the photographer mm-hmm. and, um, and, and I heard him on the phone um, packaging a new deal. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the most exciting things I'd ever heard. And it was just I, – I happened to be overhearing him because I was sitting in his office while he was taking the call. And I thought, I don't know what that guy's doing. Mm-hmm. But whatever that is, I want it. I want to be a part of that. I want to do that every day of my life. It, it just – I connected with it on on so many different levels. So, yeah, it really you know became then a question of learning – how to do that? How do you put all those pieces together? And a lot of it, unfortunately, is trial and error. You know, yes. 
You don't, you don't know. There's no, there's no school. I mean, you, there's no school you can go to learn this kind of stuff. I teach it now. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Mm-hmm. But prior to that, you know, I mean, even in film school, um, they don't teach you that kind of stuff. No, they don't. And it's, uh, and it is not only an art form, but I mean, it's a lot of filmmakers, uh, especially like the people listening to this podcast, a lot of times they don't understand that it is about, it's a business. Uh, and a friend of mine, Suzanne Lyons always says, um, the, the word show and there's a word business and the word business has twice as many letters as the word show. Well, and- I, I agree with her. And I actually know Suzanne, I, I see her out a lot on the circuit because we're in the same circles a lot in terms sure. of pan- panels and stuff. Sure. And um, my catchphrase in that regard is, and I say this at the beginning every time I speak, mm-hmm. is um, when it comes to these movies, and I think this is very important, particularly for first and second time filmmakers, my catchphrase is getting the money isn't the hard part. Mm-hmm. Getting the money back is the hard part. <laughs> That's actually a great saying. That's right? true. And, and that really is true. I mean, in the world that I live in, you know, I got a million people coming to me every day. I'm going to probably have a hundred of them today at the summit, right? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. The U.S. Uh, China Summit Film Summit this, uh, today uh, at the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And um, you know, people come up to me all the time. Oh, you're an executive producer, particularly when they see that on the business card, and they go, "Will you read my script?" Uh, That's usually the first thing. <laughs> oh, jeez, you poor man. <laughs> Yeah, and and, 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 and and unfortunately, you know, and again, not to be smog or anything, but the answer is always emphatically no. I'm not going to read your script because that's not what we're looking for in the world that I operate in. We're not looking for scripts. We, we got a million scripts. There's good scripts out there. What we're looking for is opportunities, investment opportunities. Mm-hmm. Investors aren't looking to invest in 100 pieces of paper with words on them. They don't understand that. It does not compute. And what I try to explain to these filmmakers, which is why I do my best to try to educate them even if I have to do it myself, mm-hmm. is to say, listen, you have to. You can't expect them to understand your language. They're not going to understand the language of the antagonist and the protagonist. Mm-hmm. They're not going to understand the difference between your ending and your alternate ending. They're not even going to read your script. As an, as an investor, what they're interested in is when, how much money do you need, how much am I going to get back, and when am I going to get it? And those are the answers that I have to address on a daily basis. And that is determined by many factors, which we'll get into as we continue our interview, because that is a that is a, a lot of different moving parts to get that money back. And 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 I, I say it all the time. It's like, you know, if you if you make a if you make a movie for a hundred thousand um, dollars, to make a hundred thousand dollars back is difficult, depending obviously on the cast and the genre, but it's a difficult thing. That's why – what's the percentage of films that that actually make money in the in the independent world? It's, it's a small percentage. Well, well, it is a small percentage. But, you know, there's there's a lot of different varying degrees. And, 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 and again, even to what you just said, mm-hmm. my response mm-hmm. is this. You know, it's, it's not about making 100000 back. It's about making 200000 <laughs> Yes, <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> so, not, I mean, you know, getting the money back is great. You know, it's better than not. Mm-hmm. I'm right. Because I, in fact, you know, I've coined, you know, the, the, uh, the, the term ROI, right? Sure. Return, return on investment. Uh-huh. Well, I've re, re, recoined that phrase as ROI, return of investment. Right. right. right? Because in, in my world, as long as the investors don't lose them, right? So somebody gives me a million bucks for a movie mm-hmm. and I only have King him back 350000 I'm in trouble. Sure. Right. And, and, if, and if it happens to be my first time, then how am I going to go ever get out of that hole to be out raising money on my second movie when I'm still in the hole three, three, three quarters of a million dollars on my first one? So the trick is to do it right the first time. <clears throat> and a lot of the times what that means is slowing the process down, managing your expectations and, you know, giving yourself an opportunity to build and to grow your career like I did. You know, I started off making these really low budget, and this was 15 years ago, mm-hmm. really low budget horror movies. But I did like five or six of them in a row mm-hmm. before I ever even attempted to make any kind of a genre film. By the time I made my genre film, I had so much experience mm-hmm. uh, and I had done so many things wrong. I had made so many mistakes mm-hmm. that – this was my opportunity to, to, to right those wrongs, and I was able to do that. We made a great movie. 
Um, David Arquette and Vivica Fox came on board to, for that particular film, mm-hmm. and um, and we did it and we did it right. And then then we were able to sort of set the precedent for ourselves to say, okay, now we go from this you know seven hundred thousand dollar movie to one point two, and then in the next movie we'll go to one point eight, mm-hmm. and that's how we graduate up to the kinds of films I'm making now. Right, and that's the thing a lot of filmmakers don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that's going to take work and time and years to do because nope. it, it is. Yep. Nope. They don't want to put the time in. They want, they literally, I'm telling you, this happens to me all the time. They walk into my office, they hand me a script and they're waiting for me to write a check. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Are I'm you, not, are you serious? I, I, I'd like to say I was kidding, but I'm not. Now I'm not saying that happens all the time, sure. but I, it happens way more often than it needs to. And this is the reason why I think people, this is why I do shows like this yeah. uh, because, you know, for me, it's about really getting people to understand how this thing works and the reality of it, not the fantasy of it. The fantasy of it is I'm going to write a script. I'm going to show up at some festival or some kind of a something. And I'm going to walk around AFM and somebody's going to discover me and they're going to think I I have the greatest script ever. And they're going to, and they're going to go give me the money, right? They're not going to go make it. They're going to give me the money and trust me to go make it, even though I've never done this before. So that's just not reality. So it's, do you, do you think that has a little bit to do with the the early '90s kind of lottery ticket mentality that Sundance created with the El Mariachis, the Reservoir Dogs, the Clerks, the Slacker? That you know, all yeah. these kind of movies just showed up, and you know, at the time, uh, the big man on campus, Harvey, <laughs> uh, who's not so much anymore, uh, yeah. you know, he just walked in and would buy, you know, give millions of dollars and all of a sudden these careers were launched and everyone thought like that's the they would just went they only saw the lottery ticket winners they never saw the millions of people who bought tickets and never won do you agree right. yeah and that's a great an- analogy because that's exactly and i'm not saying that there was anything wrong with that i think that those yeah. were, i remember those days it was that was fun and exciting and thrilling and just the just if you walked into that thing with the realization that that, that there's a chance at that oh i Say, you know, that's great, but don't don't have that be your plan A, right? <laughs> that's, <laughs> right? That's, that that's so many plan A's. A's. <laughs> and it can't be your plan A. Your plan A has to be a strategy and a structure and hard work and dedication and commitment and sacrifice and loss. That's your plan A. Your plan B is somebody coming in and write you a check. You know, so right, those right. those days have, have changed. And, and, and But it goes to everything else too. I mean, look, I you know, everybody uses the same examples. I'm so. If I hear one more person come to me and say, "Well, look at Sylvester Stallone." Oh, you're kidding me! What, from look, Rocky. Look, 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 look at Matt and Ben. Are you right? kidding me? <laughs> or, 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 I'm not kidding. Or look at look at um, uh, uh, Paranormal Activity. You know what I mean? Uh, Blair Witch. Yeah, sure. You know that today, even still today, when I get the pre- pe- pitch decks that they send, that Blair Witch is still on. This no. is like 30 years ago. <laughs> And they're still using that as the example of what this could be. It's the lottery ticket mentality. It's crazy talk. It's yeah. It's actually yeah. We were pitching. We're, we're uh, a friend of mine's putting together a pitch deck right now for a project, and they were starting to pull out some stuff. I'm like, guys, you, ten years. That's the that's the don't go yeah. past ten years. Don't yeah. don't go like well the matrix. I'm like I don't want to hear about the matrix. And don't, and don't compare <laughs> your seven hundred fifty thousand dollar budget film to one that was made for 15.5 million yeah just you know you can you can do your comparables in terms of the genre or the feel or the flavor of the movie mm-hmm. but you can't compare the box office right right you can't do it it doesn't make sense yeah you know, the, the, the goal at the beginning shouldn't be look in my opinion this is just me and my experience and you know my take but the goal shouldn't be, you know, first time out, big, huge hit, $5 million budget, first time director, 5,000 theaters. Because, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't, it just, it doesn't make any word. sense. I'm not saying that that's not a, a, a possibility, a remote possibility. But what I'm saying is if you go into that first and second film with the understanding that my only goal is to get in there, make a great movie. Something that people will respond to, that the general public will respond to, that investors and distributors will respond to because that's the big part of the business. Because if the distributors aren't buying, you got nothing. So you can spend a million bucks and still end up with a movie that nobody wants. But at the end of the day, if you can succeed in your first and or your second time mm-hmm. by doing a, bu- a, a budget, a low budget movie somewhere in that like 500 to maybe a million dollar range, 
and you're a, or even a little bit lower, 250, 300, and you're able to actually make a good movie mm-hmm. that gets distribution and returns money back to the investors mm-hmm. and makes profit for the rest of the folks like the distributors and yourself as a filmmaker, if you can do that, I don't care if your movie's two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Now you've got your first building block. You've earned your stripes and it's time to move on to the next level. Do, do Did you ever see, I'm assuming you saw the movie Dumb and Dumber? Uh-huh. Years ago. Remember that moment where Jim Carrey was trying to pick up that girl and she's like, look, there's no chance for you right. you'll ever, and he's like, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I think I think that's basically the mentality of, of filmmakers that they go into like you have no chance of winning Sundance and getting a you know that five thousand you know th- theater run of your of your twenty thousand dollar movie. You like yeah. so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> of course, there's a remote chance I can win the lottery tomorrow, but. Any- possible anything is possible and you know and and and, you know and i and i look at i look i look at um like elena dunham for example is is an example of that right sure i'm not saying that stuff doesn't happen it it does yeah the duplass brothers yeah a bunch of them yeah but look and that doesn't mean that lena dunham didn't pay her dues i don't know her story but but my point is that you know sometimes you do hit it it just hits the right moment is the right time and that's great but in the meantime look this is what i say to my filmmakers i go I, I, I teach these free classes. I, I don't know if you know that, but mm-hmm. I teach a film finance class and it's free because I want people to be able to come and get this information. And, and what I say to them is, look, there's, there's usually 80, 100 people in the room, right? Mm-hmm. And I go, look, if you're here, there's only two categories for me. Either you're here to make a movie, to get a movie financed, in which case I am not your guy. Or you're here to build a long-term filmmaking career and play the long game, in which case I'm the guy you want to talk to. I'm all about playing the long game, building relationships out, taking your time, having patience, having a strategy, and making one move after the next after the next to get to an ultimate goal. And instead of the, one, the one-off person who's coming up to me going, I want to make this movie. It's my passion. You know, I understand passion projects, right? Mm-hmm. I have one. But at the end of the day – this is what I say to the first timers. If somebody comes to me with a three or $5 million film that they want to direct and it's their passion project and they have to direct it, my response to that is that's great, except don't do that one first. Mm-hmm. Like, do that one fifth or fourth or third, right. but go out and make another movie, you know, on the lower end. And cut your teeth and get your experience on set and earn your keep and save that quote unquote passion project. If it's that, if you're that passionate about it, then don't use it as your guinea pig. Mm-hmm. Save it for a day when you have the experience and you have some clout and you have investors behind you and you have a little bit of a track record with distributors. That's when you want to do that. That is some amazing advice. It's it's so true because you see all these filmmakers that and I've God I've worked with them and I've seen them and they show up and they like look this is my baby I've been working on this script for five years I'm like well that's mistake number one you shouldn't be working on a script for five years you should have at least five scripts at least yep, during that do you agree you know yeah, you same. can't you can't put all your eggs in that one basket you kind of have yeah. to it's you know as a creative process you know Da Vinci didn't uh, didn't just make the the, the Mona Lisa. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. You know, he had a lot of other art projects going on at the same time. Um, now, how does a filmmaker go about finding financing for their indie film? How do you, how do they approach it? Like, can you explain maybe a pitch deck or like, I, let's say I have a movie. I have three movies. Let's say I'm, I'm a little bit ahead. I have three scripts, um, but I have no talent attached. I have nothing. What's the steps that I have to go to try to get any of these projects off the ground? Okay. Well, I guess the first place to start is with your genre, right? Because mm-hmm. that happens to me a lot. People will bring me three or four projects and say, which one do I do first? And, you know, wh- 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 one of the questions I get a lot of people say to me, what kind of movies do you like to make? Well, my stock response to that is I like to make the kind of movies that sell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So Good advice. Right. Now, that said, 
It's because there is a market. You know, this is this is a business. And at the end of the day, there are certain things that are going to take a lot longer to get around to recouping, you know, uh, investment than others. So there are certain genres that sell right now. And thriller is, is among them, very high up there, any kind of a thriller. Um, also of, of action movies. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, family movies. Now, I'm putting um, horror aside to the, to the side because mm-hmm. to me that's like a separate entity all, all, all of its own. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, so I'm talking about just in terms of the genre base. But at that point, the first thing you need to do is be organized about your approach. I mean, I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, um, I'll say to them, well, what's your budget? And they, they literally throw a number out, uh, out of the air. They're like, oh, I can make this for 1.5. <laughs> like, oh, really? No budget, <laughs> no schedule, no nothing, breakdown. <laughs> nothing. Right? Right. So I'll, I'll trick them and I'll go, oh, your budget's 1.5. And they go, yeah. I go, okay, can you do me a favor? And e- email that to me. I want to take a look at your budget. And they're like, well, I don't actually have a budget. <laughs> Or a schedule, <laughs> or a schedule, and and I'm like, well, then how do you how do you know how do you know how do, how and and you're actively out there right now trying to raise money for a movie when you don't even know how much you need. Right, it's the only it, business in the world that does that. <laughs> it really is. It, it absolutely blows my mind how this can be the case because and it and it happens more often than than you believe most people won't even admit that they don't have a budget and one of the biggest problems with filmmakers and i think this is an important point because Mm -hmm. this affects all of us by the way Mm -hmm. but what i'm about to say has a a a domino effect and a dramatic impact on us as an industry Mm -hmm. as a community of filmmakers is that if you've got people going out there that are making the rounds, trying to raise money prematurely, which is the majority of these people Mm -hmm. out there trying to raise money when they're not ready. They do not have the right to be knocking on investors' doors. I'm not talking about my investors or your investors. I'm talking about their own investors. Mm -hmm. They should not be doing it. It's different if they're going out for a friends and family round and they want to raise $20,000, $30,000 and make a short film. But if they're out legitimately trying to make a, 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 a feature film that's going to potentially pick, get picked up and get distribution and maybe even someday go to theaters, mm-hmm. they, they have a responsibility to do it right. And running around with a script and saying, can I have a million dollars, please, is insane. It makes no sense. And it reflects poorly on everybody else that's out there busting their butts trying to do it right. So you've got to have a plan. For me, it's development, development, development. You've got to go through the development phases. And not only do you have to have a budget and a schedule, because all that's going to do is tell you how much it's going to cost to make, but you better have some kind of projections or evaluations in the, in the world. You know, now, how, and, the, how, and how do you get those, by the way, so, so well, people understand? The, I get those. A, that's a tough one, I will admit, because that's easier said than done. What I would start now – um, you could just walk into any distributor at, at, at the AFM or you could, in anybody's office mm-hmm. and plop down a script and say, hey, this is my cast list. Can you run some numbers on me? And people would be more than happy to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's changed dramatically over the last five or six years. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason it's changed is because what was happening was the filmmakers were going in and getting these numbers from these distributors. And then once they raised the money somehow, they, would, they wouldn't come back. Right. Right. They'd go somewhere else to do their deal. And now these these distributors felt used and abused because they were being used for their for their projections and then not being able to cash in on the business. So they they just basically stopped. So that does that's a little tougher. I do have my own um, exclusive deal with distributors to be able to provide those, although there's a cost to it, but I'd rather pay for them and have them be accurate Mm -hmm. because the other thing that you want to be careful of is there's a lot of, uh, companies and websites and all the internet now where you can get quote unquote algorithms, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. Which look, I get, it's the age of technology and I'm an old fashioned guy, but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, an algorithm isn't going to give you the real 
numbers. What, what we do when we go out for our sales numbers, I have a team of people who pick up the phone and actually call buyers around the world mm-hmm. and talk about specifically your film at your genre level with your director choices, your actor choices. Mm-hmm. And, and I, we collect data and we start off with a minimum guarantee from a big domestic company whose name I can't mention. Mm-hmm. And then we work off of that and actually pick up the phone. So for us, doing estab- establishing valuations for a film takes weeks. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Now, to, can you explain a little bit about what you're – so uh, when you're getting those evaluations, that's based on uh, genre. Not it has nothing to do with the creative. This is strictly on genre, Correct. director, and cast. There's, yeah, there's four – well, there's four categories. Okay. There's, there's budget or budget range. Mm-hmm. Call it budget range. Um, director, cast, and genre. Yeah, those are the four things. And you're absolutely right, Alex. That's like the point I'm trying to make here is that – None of this has anything to do with your story. <laughs> it's as rough yeah. as that sounds. It's it the truth. Not, at, when we're at when you're at that level, which is where I'm at, like daily mm-hmm. with, in conversation, nobody th- th- at that point we're, we're not even discussing that. This is a mathematical equation that has to be solved. I have a movie that's going to spend 1.5, and I need to get back a minimum of three to break even, and so. What I'm looking for from my sales estimates are three numbers usually, the low, a medium, and a high. And that, if, if, and my, rule of, my personal uh, rule of thumb is that my low should be two times budget. So if I'm going to spend a million five on a film, I need to know that at the worst case scenario, I can bring in three million in the low column around the world if I were to sell the rights to my film to all of the territories in the world, including the United States. So if my low is three – and my medium is four, and my high is five, then I know I'm safe. That's the only time I am then willing to put myself in front of an investor and go, look, these, this is not a promise. There's no guarantee. But based on our research, extensive, valid, accurate research, mm-hmm. based on this particular – the criteria of this film, these are our projections. And then I'm entitled – to ask that investor to write me a check for $1.5 million and only then. And when you think about going to that extent, now, of course, you can have a presentation deck. But the pitch, the pitch deck is just designed to pique their interest. The pitch deck shouldn't be designed to, in my opinion, to convince somebody to write me a check for $1.5 million. All that should be is say, oh, this is interesting. I like the idea. I like the people. I like the concept. Mm -hmm. Let me sit down with these people and find out what the skinny is. And now you start presenting empirical data Mm -hmm. that shows an investor why this is a good investment. And it can't just be because I'm going to win an Oscar someday and this is my (laughs) first script. That can't be the reason. (laughs) I, and I laugh because I've heard that story too many times. Uh, this is going to win an Oscar or this is going to win Sundance and it's going to be – we're all going to make millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, but, that, I don't have a, but I don't have a budget or a schedule yet. I'll let you know when I do. So, but, or cast. Right. Or cast. Well, I mean cast, <laughs> I understand. That's going to take some time. But my point is you have to take the steps. You right. just have to. And you know, it, it, it's just – it's going to work again against you and it's going to, and you know, and to your point earlier, I got people that literally come back to me five years later with the same project. Uh, right. Yes. And they're like, they've been through it all. And they're like, okay, Franco, we, you know, can we, is there anything? And I'm like, well, what's changed? Like, do you have any money in the bank? Have you attached any talent? You know, have you done this? Have you done that? No, 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 no. Well, then you're exactly where you were five years ago. And those are the same people, back to what you mentioned before, that don't have any other projects. This is their film. This is the one that they've been fighting for for five years, which is great. I'm, I'm all for fight. Mm-hmm. But don't just sit around with that one film, you know, and not have any other options to present. Uh, can you do me a favor? Can you turn off your uh, or, or close out your mail program? My mail? Yeah, because I keep hearing a ding. So it oh, looks like okay. email's coming in. Okay, that yeah, you're right. Hold on. Let me do that. I'll edit this part out. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. 
No, this is great. This is great. That, that should that should have done it. All right, great. Um, so with all the with all the, you were talking about selling overseas and selling different territories, how does the new digital landscape play into all of your distribution plans, like the Netflix and the iTunes and the TVOD and the SVOD? How does that work now uh, comparatively to just like five years ago, which that really didn't exist as, in the same way? Yeah, I mean it's essentially taken over. Mm-hmm. But, you know, which isn't isn't a bad thing. It, 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 look, this, this you, if you're going to survive, I've been in, I've been doing this for 20 years. Mm-hmm. If you're going to survive in this business, you have to be willing to kind of you know move along with the technology and go with the advancements. I mean, I remember back when DVDs was the way we made our living. Oh God, it was so much money back then. Oh God, you know, it's so much money. So and, much. And, but you know, those days are over, and that was a big shift to have to make. And back in those days, when you went to a distributor, there was no such thing as anything other than mm-hmm. them having the whole world to sell, right? So they had the international and the domestic, mm-hmm. and there was no distinction in domestic within the domestic between uh, theatrical or VOD or, or 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 digital because there was no such thing, like you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. so was no distinction it was all one thing and then there was a moment i remember when some of these companies started popping up and there were some of them that are very good at it that decided oh well we're good at digital so let's just just do digital mm-hmm. so now you're separating your rights three ways right you might have an international company for your uh, foreign sales mm-hmm. you have a domestic company for your domestic sales and then you separate again out yet uh, one more time for the for the uh, for the digital now, hopefully your domestic people have a good enough relationship on that on those platforms like we do, where you can kind of keep you know keep those things together. Mm-hmm. Um, and but again, it's so complex, and it goes back to what we're talking about throughout this whole interview is that, that you know people think it's so easy. They literally say to me, "Oh, I'm going to bring this to Netflix," <laughs> right? Right. But first of all, you have to make it before you bring it in. <laughs> Yeah, this is a perfect Netflix movie. Do you have a budget? Well, no. Do you have a schedule? Well, no. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got to make it first. And look, and, and, and look, I want to go back to, to even even more basic, is that when I talk about these films, you know, I, I'm hard on a lot of these uh, first and second timers because I want to help them. Yes, right? yes. I'm not trying to embarrass them. I'm not trying to make them feel foolish. I'm trying to educate them and say, listen, guys, if you want to fast track this thing, then you got to pay attention. You got to pay attention to what's happening in this industry. And when you make a film, there are three three films you make. There's the one that you write and the one that you shoot and then the one that you edit. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, it's up to you as the filmmaker to deliver the the right the good film that mm-hmm. we're all expecting here. Mm-hmm. So, I don't care how great your script is and I don't care how amazing your shoot was. If you get into the editing room and you botch this thing up and it turns out to be a piece of crap movie, which it can happen. And it has happened to me. Mm-hmm. I've had that happen to me where everything went great, but then the final cut was just a disaster. And we had to keep recutting it and recutting it to the point where we cut, we cut it so bad that it became a loss. We just couldn't get, we just couldn't keep up with it. So whatever you're out there. Oh, sh- sorry about that. I don't, it's all right. We'll keep whatever, it on. All right. Whatever you're out there, you know, uh, promising that you're going to deliver, you actually have to deliver Mm -hmm. because otherwise not only do you run into the problem of potentially losing money for your investors, but you could end up in a position where, you know, you're going to have a hard time getting a job. So, Franco, uh, there's a big myth out there that I hear a lot of, and I want you to, to see if you can clarify this for me. A lot of times filmmakers are like, oh, you know, we're trying to get money, but they always told us, they always tell us that if you have some money first, even if it's a little bit, it helps. So if, I, if I'm looking for a $300,000 budget and I have 50 grand in the bank that I raised with friends and family, is it easier to get the gap financing or for the rest of the money to show up? 100%. Yes. So let's talk about that because that's a, another one of my little pet peeves. <laughs> right? Yes. And again, look, because, because it, it, is, it is what it is. And, 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 and if, you, if you're going to play the game, then you have to play by the rules. And, and you can't make up your own as you go along. Right? Mm-hmm. So the reality is absolutely not only uh, is it a good idea, it's a requirement. 
If you don't have at least 30% of your budget on your own, Mm -hmm. then where is your skin in the game? That's my question. This is your project. It's your, you know, life livelihood. It's your creation. Mm -hmm. And maybe Mm -hmm. you might even be the director. So you cannot expect somebody to come in and take 100% of the risk on your dream. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to go out and raise 300,000, if I need 300,000, Absolutely. If you, my, that's actually my structure. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. People who work and do films with me and through me are required to bring in 30%. Now, let me, let me explain that. They don't have to go out and get somebody to write a check for 30%. I will help them. Uh, That's my skill set, right? Mm -hmm. So your skill set might be creative, writing, directing. That's not my my skill set. My mm-hmm. skill set is financing, money, distribution, and closing investors. That's my skill set. Mm-hmm. So you do your job, I'll do mine. But your job as the filmmaker or the rights holder of a project mm-hmm. is to identify and qualify a potential investor who could put up 30%. So if you have that person – all you need to do is set up a meeting or a Skype call with me and you and that person, mm-hmm. and I will I will give them the information required for them to make a sound decision about whether or not they should put $100,000 into your production account um, and start the ball rolling. And then once they do that, I can take it from there. I'll help you. Ra- I will raise the other $200,000 for you. Mm-hmm. Right? That's part of my job. That's right. part of my function. But I can't start from zero with just a script. Even if you have a great package, even if you've done the development properly, you know, I, I, you know, I have a lot of rules of thumb. One of them is, and again, this depends on the budget because most of these budgets that I work with are like a million to three million, right? Mm-hmm. So in that, when you're in that world, you should expect to spend at least twenty five thousand dollars in development money. Okay, that should be the first thing they're out looking for. Is where am I? And a lot of people doing Kickstarter and all that other stuff, which is great. There's a million ways you can you can find that money. But mm-hmm. if you're committed, you'll find a way to get that twenty five thousand dollars. That twenty five thousand dollars puts you in a position to f- properly develop the film and do the things we talked about, like a budget and a schedule and hiring a casting director and bringing in an attorney, <laughs> right? And mm-hmm. all of the th- and getting an LLC and all of the things that you need to do to make this thing real for investors. You, that's th- you're comparing that to walking around with a script and saying, give me a million dollars or here's my business, here's my LLC, here's my business plan, here's my bank account. And by the way, I got 30% of that money in the account, Mr. Investor. Would you like to talk? Right. And let's not forget the product placement memorandum as well. <laughs> you mean the PPM? Yeah, mean? the PPM. Isn't that needed as well? Not re- I, don't, I don't use them. Oh, good. Oh, good. Good to know. Yeah, I don't use them. I've heard, yeah, I've heard, yeah, but the LLC is something very important as well as... Well, uh, yeah, you need an LLC because you need a bank account. Right, to, get right? This, to, to accept this money. <laughs> yeah, because here's the other thing. I, I will literally say, again, in the class, um, how, many of you, uh, how many of you guys are actively ra- raising money for your features? And like you know, 17 or 20 hands will go up. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, okay, so how many of you actually have an LLC in the name of the movie? Now, I'm not talking about in the name of your production company mm-hmm. or whatever, right? But if you have a movie – you should have an LLC set up in the name of that movie. And then once you have that LLC, you need to set up a bank account because – and when, when I asked that question, out of the 18 people who might have raised the hand, only two of them still <laughs> had their hand up. Right. Which means I'm saying to them, OK, so if you're out raising money right now and you came to me after the class and uh, you asked me to write you a check for 150 k and I said yes, who will I make the check out to? Jesus. Oh, I'm not going to make it out to you because mm-hmm. I'm not – investing in you. I'm not going to make it out to your production company because that's not who I'm investing in either. I'm investing in your movie and you don't have any place for me to put my money. And you're wondering why you can't raise any because you haven't even get the universe. You haven't provided a place within the universe to receive this money. (laughs) 
it's 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 so basic and logical that it's scary but there's also that but there's also when you create an llc it's like oh wow this is starting to get and and i I know how filmmakers think because i'm a filmmaker and i've worked with so many that they think wait if i open up an llc now i have to do taxes and if you open one up in 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 california for god's sakes it's eight hundred dollars and i have to put investments in guess what else you can do the exact same thing for 50 bucks Want, to, want me to tell you how? Please. You do the exact same thing for 50 bucks. Tell me. You go down to the county clerk's office in L.A. There's one, uh, one at the courthouse and one in, uh, I don't know, mm-hmm. there's two clerk houses in uh, Los Angeles if mm-hmm. you live here. And you open up a DBA for $25 mm-hmm. in the name of the movie. Mm-hmm. And you walk out of it. And I've done this a dozen times. You literally walk out of that office at 11 o'clock in the morning with a stamp you know, form that they hand you Sure. and you by noon, you're at your bank opening up a bank account in the name of the movie under a DBA doing business as. Yeah. But that DBA would open up that DBA is based off of your existing company. Correct. Well, no, it's a brand new, this is a brand new DBA. The only difference is technically and legally it's actually a sole proprietorship. So it's it's under your name. It's still a it's like opening up an extra personal banking account, but at least it's in the name of the film. Uh-huh. At which point later when you create the LLC, you can flip the account. That's genius, man. <laughs> you can turn it from a DBA into an LLC. So you don't have to pay the $800 in taxes. You can re- you can set up shop in Louisiana, open up your LLC there if that's where you end up shooting the film. Mm-hmm. But in the interim time, while you're raising the money, you actually have a bank account legally set up, you know, to that now you're personally responsible for that for that as income. So if somebody writes you a check for hundred grand, it's, it technically looks like you personally received that money. But that's a small price to pay because you can flip that later. Sure, you, you can, can in taxes. You can yeah. You, you can, can liability later. So all I'm saying is that not opening an LLC is okay um, if you're not ready, but that doesn't mean you can't open up a bank account and start receiving funds. That's brilliant. That, that that that's worth the entire interview just for that little piece of advice because I know a lot of filmmakers have an issue with that. I did when I was opening up my first films. Uh, it, it's a pain, especially here in California. <laughs> yeah. Now, what um, can we talk a little bit about project financing feasibility, which is such <laughs> a big thing? And I know that's a big word for a lot of the listeners, but. Man, you know, I get, I get, I get pitched. I get pitched for God's sakes. I'm not even a money guy. I get pitched movies constantly, which is I find hilarious. But and they send these projects, and you're just like, and they're like, look, it's, I just need fifty. I just need twenty million. I just twenty million. I can make this thing happen. Yeah. Uh, well, t- how about how about Robert De Niro and Brad Pitt are dying to do this film <laughs> <laughs> together, together. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I just need the money. Right. I, I, I have everything I need except the money. That's the other one. I oh, that's the that's the, yes. I have all, all I need is a check, and we can yeah. and we could start. We're ready to go. We're ready to rock. We could pull the trigger tomorrow. We're in production. <laughs> so <laughs> I know it's funny, but it's we laugh because we've both been through it, and, and it's <laughs> and we've heard all of that. I've heard the I've heard the oh yeah. All I need is a, just just a check, and we could get the ball rolling. Like everything else is in place. We could just need a little gas in this engine. Oh, oh dear Lord. <laughs> We've built the car. All I need is a little gas. Come on. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about project finance feasibility and, 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 the, and the truth, the raw truth of what that is? Well, I mean, I mean, it's all of the above. You know, like I said, it, it really comes down to, you know, how many of these movies actually get made? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. when you consider how many are out there. People say to me all the time, they're like, oh, Franco – Wow, you know, I looked at your IMDb and you got like 38, uh, you know, films on your – and I'm like, yeah, but that that doesn't – you can't see the 380 that I didn't get done, right? <laughs> you, can, you can see the ones that I did, but you can't see all the ones that didn't get done, right? Because there's so many factors involved and sometimes you get so close and sometimes the money – isn't even real. I mean, are you kidding me? There's these schemes and these scams. And if you could put in 10%, we're going to bring you the other 90%. You know, when people hear stuff like this, you have to run the other way. 
You know, for me, there's only one way to raise money is to sit down in front of a check writer, an actual person, a human being, and tell them your story. You know, not your movie pitch, but your story. Because what these people are doing is they're believing in you. Right. And right. If they believe in you that you can execute what you say you can execute. You know, and some people, they oversell themselves. It's not necessary. Sometimes what you have is already enough. Mm hmm. You don't have to exaggerate. You don't have to paint this pie in the sky. What you, they, they, nobody's going to respect you for that. If you're going to sit down in front of somebody who's going to potentially write you a check, you're going to be honest with them. You're going to be able to say things like, look, you may never see this money again. You're going to invest in me, and it's possible that this thing might not work. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do everything in my power and I'm going to bring all the resources that are available to me. Mm -hmm. And this is what I say to my own investors. And I've done this a hundred times. But that doesn't guarantee it's going to work this one, this mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. right? I can't promise anything. As soon as I hear people say to me, but Franco, can you guarantee? I go, stop. Okay. <laughs> Whatever – Whatever's going to come out of your mouth next, the answer is no. <laughs> right. Because I do not use that word in my presence. I cannot guarantee you a thing. There are no guarantees. This is a business. This is a investment. This is risk. And this is supposed to be fun. Right. right. So what we're looking to do here is bring a bunch of talented people together and make something really special, something, something great that's going to hopefully work. It's going to resonate with the, with, the, with the audience, with the movie-going audience, and it's going to maybe get some accolades along the way, but it's going to do its job. And its job is to get a message across to the world while at the same time um, be able to at least pay the investors back, make some money for the distributors and for ourselves, mm -hmm. and be able to live, you know, live to see the next day. So in terms of feasibility, it really comes down to how practical you are going into – the situation and whether you're going to look at this thing as a systematic approach. Look, I developed this entire the, um, development program mm -hmm. that, that I represent purely out of selfishness. <laughs> and it really was because when I first started, I was pulling my hair out, which is why I don't have any. <laughs> but I was pulling my hair out trying to figure this thing out because I was like, this is insane. This is the wild, wild west. You know, running around town trying to piecemeal this thing together. And I thought, here we have the studio system, which, you know, I am not a part of, nor am I interested in being a part of. Mm -hmm. But the studio system works because it is a system, right? There is a system. A project comes in, it goes through a process, it gets green lit, some more writers come in and work on it, blah, blah, blah. It ends up in 5,000 theaters across the country. That's a system. Well, we don't have that in the independent world, and it was driving me nuts because I operate best when I'm organized and I'm operating with a system. So I created one for myself selfishly mm -hmm. by bringing in this $25,000 for development, like spending that money. And by the way, what I do with that 25000 that comes in on development, mm -hmm. if somebody invests in my movie as a development investor for twenty-five dollars mm -hmm. I return that money plus 20%. Mm -hmm. But I return it out of the budget. Right. So those people get their money back, 30000 before I even shoot my first frame. They're out of, the, out of the deal. They get their money. They get their principal back. They get their 20% and they're, and they're out. And then now and – I, and I add that in as a line item in my budget as a development cost. Right. So these, these are little things that I've learned along the way to help make this thing make sense – to the people that are involved and to go down this track where I, there's a system in place that it makes it feasible mm -hmm. for an investor to want to come in and plop their money down. Now, is there, is there a system that – because I've heard many different kind of um – kind of financial structures of how investors get their money back. I've heard the 80-20 rule. Uh, I've heard, you know, all, all first monies go out to some people and, you know, filmmakers don't get anything. What generally, is there a general rule of thumb? Is there one that you go by as far as like 
first money's in X amount of dollars go back to them and X amount of dollars goes to filmmakers. I, I don't know. What's your financial breakdown? Is that something I mean, we can there, discuss? There, there's, a, there's, there are industry standards. So industry, like I just got one the other day in the email box, just today, I think it was actually last night. And it said, we're looking for something like, I don't know, five or $7 million. They were asking me personally to invest. And they said that they're looking for five or $7 million and that they were going to, and that they were offering their investor 25%. Well, that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. You know, how it works is, you know, because the, the first money is usually equity because equity is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what that 30% usually it has to be. It has to be equity. It can't be, you know, people say to me, oh, I have 30%. I go, oh, okay, can I see your 30%? They go, well, I'm going to get a tax credit in Louisiana. Well, that's not your 30%. Mm-hmm. That's a tax credit. That's a separate thing. What, when I talk about 30%, I mean, I mean real hard cash that has to be in your account, spendable cash, mm-hmm. right? So that's the money that gets returned first is your equity in, in, in theory. But there are a lot of other people, by the time you get to the point where your movie is actually funded and is actually recouping mm-hmm. revenue, there are a lot of people that didn't get in line ahead of that person. For example, the distributor, right? Because they're going to take 20% off the top. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. So – so if you so if you make a sale for hundred thousand, that hundred thousand dollar sale is technically only eighty thousand because mm-hmm. you have to give up your your commission to the distributor. So that eighty thousand becomes the first money in, mm-hmm. and that is the money. What happens is what's sh- supposed to happen is that whatever the investors put up mm-hmm. should be returned. Yes, in first position um, until they recoup one hundred and twenty percent. So if they put up a million dollars, then you're on the hook for the money to go to the investors mm-hmm. um, until you recoup 1.2 million. So now you've you've repaid your principal, your in, your interest has been paid to your investors. So now they've made their money and their profit. Mm-hmm. But then it's a 50-50 split, right? And 50 50 cents of every dollar from that point forward goes to those investors and the other 50% goes to us. Mm -hmm. So we should be making money on these movies. We should be making money. If I make a movie for a million two. if I make a movie for a million Mm -hmm. and, and it makes 5.2 million, Mm -hmm. then after my net 1.2 is paid out, there's $4 million left over 2 million of which goes to the investor pool Mm -hmm. and 2 million should come to us which gives me more money to be able to make my next movie. And speaking of that, I often say this, is that the, um, the investors aren't usually, most investors, savvy investors who are investing in film, mm-hmm. they're not doing it because they're going to make 20%. Mm-hmm. Somebody who can write a check for a million or $2 million doesn't need us to make 20% on their money. Right. Right. They're doing it because of the potential upside. So when you talk about things like a paranormal activity or my big fat Greek wedding and those movies, they did exceed expectations. Those are the ones we hear about for that reason, because somebody put in a million bucks and made 20 million or a hundred million. <laughs> and that's, and, and that's what they're looking for. That's what they're looking for. There's the potential upside. Is that because it's not about the 20% return, it's about what happens after that. Now, can you give any advice on how to attach bankable stars to a project? Which I know that's a, I mean, that's a big value if you have someone attached. And what is the term attached really mean? Letter of intent, all this kind of stuff. There's, there's a lot of gray, murky water in that situation. You're, you're, you're really trying to get me going, aren't you? <laughs> Oh boy! You I got me. I got a letter of intent. I got a letter of intent from Brad Pitt. Look, he signed it, yeah. uh, and I could. I, I just need ten mil. <laughs> Who cares? That's how I feel about LOIs. Who cares? You know what I care about? I care about picking up the phone and calling the agent and saying, "Is Brad attached?" As he read the script, because nine times out of ten, no correction, ten times out of ten, <laughs> that is not the case. To me. An LOI is meaningless. Okay. It really okay. is. Okay. For a couple okay. of reasons. Number one, a lot of the ones I get are three and four years old. They're outdated. Sure. Yeah. They've been holding on to this thing for dear life. Yes, they do yeah. hold on to dear life, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I had somebody bring me an LOI for Shirley McLean. I was so excited. I've always wanted to work with her. Sure. And I looked at the thing and I swear to God, it was dated 2009. Oh, God. I'm like, that was in one of her past lives when she signed that. <laughs> I actually, I actually once had a, a LOI that was from an actor who had had recently passed. That's the way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's insane. So, the, but 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 more, more importantly, you got to look at the content of these LOIs. They mean nothing. They're so tentative, and and they're like, you know, if maybe possibly someday you might, you know, happen to stumble on a few dollars, we might think about reading the script and possibly considering having our actor be in your movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really doesn't mean anything. They, 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 they just don't hold any water. And a lot of the times what, if they're, if they're issued at all, Mm -hmm. a lot of the time it's just to get you off their back, the agent uh, to get you off their back. Right. Right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Because here's the problem. And, and again, I get criticized for saying stuff like this, but mm-hmm. you know what? I, 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 I can't, I can't worry about that. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we should not be going out and using these actors in order to raise our money. Mm-hmm. We should be getting the money because it's the catch 22, right? Sure. The catch 22 is I can't get actors unless I have money and I can't get money unless I have actors. Well, if you had to pick one of those, go get the money first. That's what I do. And I'll tell you how in a minute. But the fact is, if you're running around using Shirley MacLaine or Brad Pitt or any of these people as a way to raise money for your movie, you're doing it wrong. Because you don't even have their – just because you have a letter of intent doesn't mean anything. The chances that these people have any idea who you are or that you even exist on this planet are no. Mm -hmm. They don't know. They don't know that you exist. And the agent does. The agent might because somebody had to issue that LOI. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you don't have anything. You don't have anything. When you have somebody attached, for me, that means I can pick up the phone and I can call their attorney or their manager or their agent. And I can, and I can hear somebody on the other end of the phone say, yes, he or she has read the script. They are, love the script. And pending their schedule and an offer, we are willing to talk. Mm-hmm. We're, we're willing to come on board this project, you know, pending pending schedule and, 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 a, and a formal offer. That's attached to me. That's somebody who I can work with because now I know what I have to go to do in order to get them. But as far as an LOI is concerned, it's so flimsy and, you know, it's really raising money off of false pretenses because – what happens if you do raise that money and then those people say, no way, I'm not interested in this movie. What are you talking about? Right. And that, now you, how are you going to go back to the investors? So the answer to that is to get your investors to put up the money on a contingency basis. Mm-hmm. Have, have it be cash contingent. Say, listen, I need a half a million bucks. And I needed to put in my production account so I can show proof of funds so that I can show the world, the agents and the talent that I'm for real. Because Mm -hmm. otherwise, just like everybody else running around, you know, talking about something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So put the money in my account and have the contract with your lawyers say, which is something that you should be buttoning down during your development phase, which is why that $25,000 development money is so important. Mm Mm-hmm is that you have the right lawyer who can do these things and knows how to do these things properly and have that agreement be contingent that I'm going to put up this $500,000 contingent on you getting one of these five actors and you you make a list. Yep. And if you, if you don't get those five, five actors, you don't get my half million. So you can sit and play with my half million for six months. Mm-hmm. But, if, but if you haven't locked somebody down in six months, I'm taking my money back. Because now, as the filmmaker, you have power because you get to go out and have that conversation. Because what do you think – there's two questions. There's three questions that the agent's going to ask when you pick up that phone. Number one, who's directing? Yes. Number two, are you financed? And number three, do you have distribution? Those are typically the the questions that that I get asked. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm coming in as an executive producer. So 
they are usually got a sense that if I'm calling, I probably have money, right? Right. But uh, that's just because I have a track record. But if you don't have a track record, they're not going to make that assumption. And you have to be able to say, yes, I have proof of funds. Can you – Money. Can, can you discuss real quick about – First time directors, because I've, I've gone through this in my career multiple times. Uh, this whole concept of the first time director and, you know, filmmakers have a script and they wrote the script and they want to direct, but they've never stepped foot on a set and they want 10 million. Like it does happen, but it doesn't happen often. Can you talk a little bit about the realities of first time directors and based on budget? Like if you're making a $50,000 movie, Hundred thousand dollar movie. I'm assuming a first time director is a little because there's less risk. But on a one, two, three, five million dollar movie with a first time director doing an action movie for God's sakes, um, you know how? What's your perspective on it? Well, the perspective is simple. It's not going to happen. Who's going to work with you? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Who, who's going to work with you? Because if you're going to make a million. Here, here, here we go again. If you're going to make a movie for $5 million, mm-hmm. you better know that you can return seven to 10 million. If you're, if you're going to come out of the gate with an expectation upon yourself to bring in seven to $10 million in gross revenue on a, on your first film, mm-hmm. you need some major, major name talent in that movie to make the draw. Oh, absolutely. Order absolutely. And who is going to work with you? That's my question. It's that simple. Who are you going to go get three action stars to come and work with you as a first time director? Because if you think you are, and unless you're, you know, related to them, (laughs) which, which I've worked with those as well. (laughs) Yeah. Either related to them or married to them, then it's not going to happen. So at the end of the day, it makes no sense. And it's a, to me, it's just a fantasy and it's exactly what I was talking about before. It's like, I don't support that. I just don't. I'm not saying it doesn't happen and God love you if you're able to succeed. But don't come knocking on my door. I, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I Phone thought, call completed. I that off too. <laughs> That's because I'm in my car. Yeah, it's like, I got you. I got you. See, someone was literally knocking at your door. <laughs> <laughs> No, I always I always tell filmmakers that the advice I give them is like, look, if you got a five million dollar movie you want to direct, go make three or four fifty thousand dollar movies. And- well, I would go to fifty thousand, but that's what, what I was saying to you earlier is that yeah. graduate, you know, yeah, you know, because because fifty thousand is going to be tough to sell, just as bad because the production value is not going to be there. So the goal the goal is you want to make a decent movie and you and you know make something for two fifty. Mm-hmm. Two fifty is reasonable. 250 is something that most people who are committed to having a lifelong career in this business can figure out how to do. Mm-hmm. You know, make a movie for $250,000, have enough money to do the things you want to do to make this movie. Don't make don't try to make too big of a movie for that kind of a budget. Make something small and contained that works. You know, and get distribution. Yeah, I can, had a, can you talk a little bit about like some keys to getting a distribution? Yeah, I mean, I had a I had a, I had a filmmaker who came to me, and it was her third time. It was her third film, and I thought, great, she's not a first time filmmaker. Blah blah blah. She was graduating from like a half a million dollar movie to one point five million dollar movie, and it all seemed to make sense. The problem was once I started shopping her out to a lot of my distributors, mm-hmm. they quickly did some research on her and realized, although this was her third feature film, neither of her first two films ever got distribution. Oh. So that so you have to really understand that this is how this thing works. Is so now just being able to say I made a three hundred fifty thousand or five hundred thousand dollar movie mm-hmm. isn't enough. If the movie never went anywhere and it's sitting on a shelf mm-hmm. and nobody's ever going to see it except your family at Thanksgiving, right? So 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 that's not even enough to have it be your third directorial, you know, attempt. Because you haven't succeeded in the first two to get distribution. Right. So, so one of the things you want to do, and this is why a lot of people do go to AFM, you know, this time of year, is to start building relationships with distributors and see if you can get somebody who's interested in your project enough to the extent that they'll start a conversation with you about coming onto your film. It's, you know, especially if it's a low budget um, feature. 
So I have a few a uh, few last questions because I don't want to take up any more time. I know you're in the middle of your conference, so thank you so much for taking the time out that you have. Um, mm-hmm. These are questions I ask all of my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Take your time. <laughs> Take your time and learn as much as you can. You know, go to these classes, go to these seminars, go to these um, events. Get out there and meet people and learn, learn, learn. You know, it's one thing to learn the craft mm-hmm. of, of writing and all that. And that's great. But learn the craft of business in the, in the, in, in the film business. Can you tell me uh, what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oh, boy. Um, oh, I can never, I can never uh, remember who his name is. Bernstein. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was something. It was something called "You're Nobody Unless You've Been Sued in This Town." <laughs> That's a great title. Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And I can't remember. And then there was another book um, about David Geffen's life. I can't remember the title of that either. Okay. Early on. But those were two books that really had a profound effect on me. And what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? The longest to learn probably would have to be um, fake it until I make it. Yes. Amen, brother. (laughs) That's a good one. one. And can you name three of your favorite films of all time? Well, my favorite film of all time, people make fun of me for this, is uh, Sunset Boulevard. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, I just think that's a classic. It is wonderful. It's wonderful. And um, I hate to say it because I don't have any really contemporary. Uh-huh. Sure. Because I'm an old film buff. Sure. Uh, but I love um, All About Eve. <laughs> okay. Another good one. Yes. And, and uh, pretty much uh, any, any, any Betty Davis movie, anything that Betty Davis or Joan Crawford did, including um, uh, the one when they both were together and they played sisters. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that they – didn't they just make the that show yeah, about it? Yeah, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yeah, OK. What was yeah. that – what was that Preston Sturgis movie um, about the writer who – goes on the train and, and discover and wants to discover like what it's real. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. I can't grab the title. Out of I my can't. Head. Yeah. But Preston, Sturges, anything Preston Sturges is amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I love the old stuff. You know why? Because I love the days when there wasn't a lot of special effects mm-hmm. and it was just real storytelling and, and the art form of acting and mm-hmm. telling the story through dialogue. And sure. I just, I love those old movies. So, so, and I'll ask you this question. I'm not sure if you want to answer it, but where can people find you? <laughs> yeah, no, listen, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not difficult to, to reach. Um, okay. you know, I'm, I'm, you know, people can call me or email me. And I think even my cell phone is like on my IMDb page, but the best way to reach me mm-hmm. is uh, through my website, which mm-hmm. is samacofilms.com. Mm-hmm. And, um, they can also, I can be emailed d- directly. Uh, if people have any questions about any of the stuff that we're talking about more deeply mm-hmm. at uh, Franco at somicofilms.com. Franco, man, thank you so much for taking out the time. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope that we've done some good here today. I hope. <laughs> well, Alex, I, I hope so too. And I thank you and I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to vent a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Franco. All right, man. Take care. Did you guys take notes? I hope you did, because I definitely did. Uh, I want to thank again Franco for for coming on to the show and, again, being so generous with his time, his experience, and his knowledge and really uh, helping filmmakers out there really understand the process of what it's like to go get money and how to do it properly. And I think it's been an amazing service uh, doing this episode. And I really, again, share this episode with as many people as you can, because it is just so valuable, this information. It's essentially a masterclass of something that they do not teach at any film school that I know of. Now, if you want links to anything we talk about in the show, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 202 for the show notes. 
And today, guys, uh, is November 28th, and it is early morning on Tuesday. And if you're listening to this episode at that time, today is the last day of the $10 sale for all filmmaking, screenwriting, cinematography, marketing courses on Udemy. All you got to do is head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash U-D-E-M-Y. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Udemy. Now, it is the holiday season, and as always, Santa Alex has a bunch of gifts and a bunch of great stuff coming up for you uh, in December and an insanely explosive January 2018 on the book. So get ready for some major content coming your way and some major, hopefully, value as well. So thanks again, guys, for everything. And I posted images from our first winner of the Stephen Pressfield uh, contest on our Facebook page as well as our Twitter. So please check that out. And if you guys, uh, any of the winners, get when you guys get the packages, please take a picture and tweet it out or email us uh, or Facebook us or whatever. Just get it to us so we can share it with the rest of the Indie Film Hustle tribe. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.